Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Really awesome guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, we first have the uh, honor of being joined today by Joseph Ferrer. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Elevation Oncology, uh, which is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that focused on the development of precision oncology products, uh, specifically antibody drug conjugates uh, for patients with genomically defined cancers. Uh, he brings over 20 years of uh, financial, strategic, and leadership experience to, uh, to the farm and biotech industry. Uh, prior to this role, he served as uh, as interim CEO and, and chief financial officer of Elevation, prior to the CFO of Cirrus Pharmaceuticals, and spent uh, over a decade as an investment banker of the biotech and pharma space, uh, including serving as managing director and co-head of healthcare investment banking at the JMP Securities, as well as being a member of the investment banking groups at J.P. Morgan and UBS. Uh, we're also joined uh, by Dr. David Dornan. He's Chief Scientific Officer of Elevation Oncology. Uh, he brings us uh, two decades of industry and academic oncology drug discovery and, and drug development experience. He has uh, experience across multiple therapeutic modalities, uh, targeting cancer susceptibility, including modulating the immune system uh, to trans translate these uh, important interventions uh, into therapeutic options for patients. Uh, previously served as a uh, uh, Chief Scientific Officer at Bolt Therapeutic, Biotherapeutics, and before that was Head of Oncology Research at Gilead, began his career at Genentech. Uh, he received his PhD from University of Dundee in Molecular Oncology and Biochemistry and did his postdoc at Genentech. Um, we have really cool topics to get into today. I'm going to have them both. I'm with Joseph Ferma, Dr. David Dunn, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, I really appreciate the opportunity. Really look forward to telling you more about what we're doing at Elevation Oncology. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I look forward to, to talking to both of you. Uh, you know, going on a deep dive into these themes. Um, but we'd love to start things off as we typically do by uh, handing both of you the floor for a little bit, just to talk a little bit more about yourselves. Um, if we could start off with you, I, I always am very intrigued by. Uh, investment bankers that uh, you know, no doubt have raised money for hundreds of companies and seen thousands of business plans that ultimately join up with a really cool biotech company. And it must be a really special reason you went there. But give us a little bit about your background story and what uh, it brought you to motivation ultimately. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you're absolutely right. I mean, my background, my journey pretty much started with it as an undergrad in chemistry. I got a degree in chemistry and really uh, of course, as part of that, got really close to science and the opportunity for science to be able to, you know, help help patients and our friends and our families that are suffering from a variety of diseases. But I also realized pretty quickly that maybe the best opportunity for me was not necessarily in the lab, but in the, in the in the intersection of science and bringing that to the people that really matter and understanding about how we can continue to drive it forward. And uh, one of my early experiences outside the lab was actually working for a life science tools company. At the time, it was Thermo Electron, now well known by all of us as Thermo Fisher. But that was probably the first time where I really got to understand that there's a lot of applications of some really cool technologies that are happening out there. And I just got a, a, th a thirst for it. And I went back and got my MBA, as, as many of us do. And you know, I found my way, as you said, into investment banking, where, again, I saw as I don't it as an opportunity to really be able to bring finance to bringing drugs to patients, because we all know it, developing drugs is capital intensive. It requires a lot of thinking. It requires a team and it requires a lot of capital as well. And as an investment banker for 15 years, 
I had the pleasure of being able to help a variety of companies do exactly that, as well as thinking strategically about partnerships, business development operations, and a lot of mergers and acquisitions transactions as well. So through all that experience, you almost develop a real um, uh, Bible of, you know, what things have worked and what things don't work. So eventually you just get a thirst for trying it yourselves. And I was very fortunate to, to start at my last company as chief financial officer and really understand what it takes to like apply that experience I had to building a company that was building a pipeline and focused in the biotechnology area. And now at Elevation, we're just taking that a step further and really leveraging the latest in technologies, in this case, antibody drug conjugates, to have a differentiated pipeline that can just improve outcomes for patients and hopefully help all of us that are suffering with, from, from cancer. So, um, so David, you, um, you know, you started out uh, early on in your research working on things like tumor suppression, p53 gene, uh, and then really spent a lot of time in this concept of of cancer heterogeneity, tumor heterogeneity, and patient heterogeneity, and ultimately, you know, what it means to be a responder to something or not. Um, talk a little bit about this time in your research because I think it's going to feed nicely into what we talk about with regard to genomically defined cancers. Yeah, sure. I mean, so really, I mean, it all starts off with like in cancer, we understand like, we'll say tumor drivers and tumor suppressors. We've known this for decades now. And really the, I'd say the, a lot of the work from the early 80s all the way through the early 2000s have resulted in drugs that really target actionable genomic um, events, right? That were mentioned like RAS, for example, we could talk about that. Uh, famous oncogene that now f there's drugs coming to fruition that are targeting it. But what we've all realized over the last 20 years is heterogeneity is a big deal because not every single cell will have the same mutation. You get um, essentially cancer cells within the population. Um, they're actually slightly different than each other than their nearest neighbors. And so ultimately what that interests uh, spun from my end, especially when I was at Genentech, well, if cancer is, which it is, an evolving beast that you have to target, right, and if it's constantly changing its mask, right, how can you best deal with that? And so that's why, you know, I spent a lot of time working on a couple of, a few different modalities where I thought that could have an impact on it. And one of them was immuno-oncology. And then the second was antibody drug conjugates. Those were the two major uh, two major approaches that I worked on that I felt like could tackle that particular problem. And the reason simply being is that, you know, when you think about the immune system, I mean, the immune system, um, actually, it does work to suppress cancer traditionally, right? Uh, you, so a lot of people have cancerous cells floating around their body, but the immune system just takes it out and takes care of it um, uh, without us even really knowing about it. Um, and then there's the whole thing about, well, how do you kill cancer cells selectively, right? But more importantly, if they're all quite different within a population, well, how can you have one drug that can wipe them out, right? And so that kind of dovetailed into why I spent my time in, in antibody drug conjugates for a good two thirds of my career and a third of my career in immuno-oncology, because those two approaches are complementary to eradicate the whole tumor heterogen heterogeneity problem. Excellent. Excellent. Perhaps we you know, introduce our audience because we haven't talked uh, really much about antibody drug conjugates yet. I mean, we, we've touched a lot on uh, immuno-oncology from the perspective of things like CAR T cells. We've touched on uh, obviously mRNA and gene therapies. Um, here we have a very elegant uh, therapy in the sense that, you know, you're combining sort of uh, the best of immuno-oncology with sort of the best of the smart drug world, putting them together. Um, I'd love for you both to address this one. Joe, first from a, just a perspective of a CEO of an immuno-oncology company uh, with a unique approach. Obviously, immuno-oncology is very hot. Uh, a little bit about sort of the background of the company was like, you know, setting it up funding it uh, in this era of, of immuno-oncology. And then, Dave, if you could take us a little more into details about ADCs, and then a little later on, we'll talk about some of the specific targets you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, and, and happy to. I mean, what we're doing at Elevation Oncology, just to piggyback on what David said and along his career is, you know, in oncology treatment, you have two ends of the spectrum. On the one end, you have chemotherapy, which is indiscriminate. It, it attacks everything that it sees. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have uber-targeted precision oncology therapies that are 
really looking at really specific true drivers of a specific cancer. But in the middle, you know, you have this wide range where there's a multitude of things that you want to do. And in that range, what we like to think about is we're focused on selective cancer therapies. We're not too broad, things that are not too specific either. You're sort of like in that middle zone where you can be selective. And selective can mean different things depending on what kind of tumor, whether you're talking solid tumors or, or HEMOC or something different. But being selective enough that you can target to the tumor where you want to target and stay away from the stuff, of course, that you don't want to target. And within that lies what we all believe is the holy grail. And that's what Elevation Oncology is trying to do, is really utilize our knowledge and these advancements in antibody drug conjugates to come to selective cancer therapies that are just going to improve treatment options for patients. Because we all know there's still a lot of wood to chop when it comes to improving oncology treatment. And we think in this zone of antibody drug conjugates, to be able to target a cytotoxic to the place where you want it is really an opportunity to be selective for better outcomes overall. Yeah. And I can extend on that just on the whole um, the ADC field. And so as Joe was touching upon there, right, that the idea of like you don't want to essentially wipe out normal cells, right? You only want to wipe out cancer cells, right? So this def this whole concept, you know, it's, it's <laughs> over a century old, right? The magic right, bill right. from Paul Ehrlich, you know, and from, you know, that uh, German physician scientist from a long, long time ago. Um, had a, had the vision that how can you eradicate disease cells or microbes even with, while sparing normal cells? And so, you know, the concept of ADCs, antibody drug countries, came up uh, based upon of, based upon that idea, right? And so, when we think about conventional chemotherapy for patients, that's a frontline treatment for many different types of cancers, right? Because well, it kind of works, right? To some degree, unfortunately, there's some patients that progress while on chemotherapy. But of the patients that do benefit, um, which obviously some are cured, which is fantastic. But during the process of treatment, um, regardless whether you respond or not, there are side effects of chemotherapy, right? Chemotherapy, basically, it targets, for the most part, dividing cells, right? And so in your body, you have a lot of dividing cells that are not cancerous cells as well. And so what can end up happening is you get these, obviously, toxicities. And so the idea behind antibody drug conjugate is essentially is using an antibody, right, which is obviously typically um, produced by B cells in your body and immune system. But in the context of cancer therapy, you make an antibody that's directed at a target that's on the tumor cell surface. And then what you do is you link up the chemotherapy to the antibody. Yep. And so by definition, what you're doing is you're now delivering the chemo selectively to the cancer cell. And then that payload or the chemotherapy therapeutic gets released from the linker if it's a cleavable linker and then that kills the cancer cell and so simplistically that's what antibody drug conjugates are um now there's lots of discussion points i'm sure within within an antibody drug conjugate but just some of the things we'll just say uh, before we get into targets is that the field has you know we'll say been in drug development real drug development for about say 20 plus years 25 years maybe there if I count a little bit more, really hardcore uh, drug discovery efforts have been on making ADCs. And we've learned lessons over the last you know, 30 years about what to do and what not to do. And just right now, this is like a new age of ADCs. And that's why in the last five years, things are really getting exciting. Things are working much better than they did like 15 years ago. And that's where I spent a lot of my time at Genentech when I was there, when you introduced the, in the bio. I spent a lot of time in ADCs there because, you know, Genentech, among other farmers, you know, we were innovating and also learning some hard lessons about what, what not to do and do. So I think right now we're at that kind of sweet spot in the science where we can now pretty much design what an antibody drug conjugate should be and which tumor to target using with fairly good knowledge about which tumor antigens are going to work and which ones are not. ADCs and, and the concept has been maturing, so has the extensive list of, of potential targets out there uh, in oncology. Uh, you've chosen uh, initially this family of proteins called cloudins, which are uh, involved in the, the 
the tight junctions between cells that allow cells to communicate, which uh, when things go wrong, uh, participate in malignant transformations and, 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 and metastasis. Uh, and the specific isoform, this 18.2, which shows up in um, not just gastric cancers, but gastroesophageal and pancreatic cancer, uh, introduce us to, to the Cloudins and a little bit of this target, if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, so Claudins, as, as you mentioned, right, these are a family of tight junction proteins. Um, and in the case of Claudin 18.2, right, it's only expressed in the gastric mucosa or the epithelial cells in your stomach lining, right? And so the idea, well, functionally, right, what it does is essentially it's acting as like a membrane barrier. So in any organs that you have, you know, you essentially, you, you have these tight junctions that keep these epithelial cells together, right? So they're not going to let anything in or out except uh, usually some form of electrolytes. That's what their job is. So Claudine 82 is protecting essentially the stomach from having too much variation in uh, pH, acidity and such like. Um, so... The Claudins are, you know, they're they're attractive nature. And there's another Claudin called Claudin Six, which is very popular in antibody drug conjugate field right now as well. It's a separate a separate Claudin tight junction protein. It's not in the stomach. It's a, it's a very different, um, we'll say, animal, if you will, for ADCs. But again, very popular for for other reasons. And really, there's what we're finding is their selectivity is what is attractive. Right. So Claudin 18.2 is only in the gastric mucosa. It's not in any other tissues. So when we think about gastric cancer, and you already mentioned that Claudin 18.2 is expressed in some non-small lung, non-small cell lung cancers. It's also expressed in pancreatic cancers, and there's potential for a variant as well. But in normal tissue, it's only in the gastric mucosa. And what the kind of the attractive part is that in the gastric mucosa, because it's in the tight junction proteins, what that means is antibodies and such like can't get access to it unless it's a cancerous cell. And so by definition, you've got this built-in selectivity window um, for an antibody drug conjugate approach. And so that's what's making these Claudins and more particularly Claudin 18.2 very attractive from an ADC target perspective, because some of the challenges usually is, as we discussed in the beginning, like how it works, that if you've got some normal tissue expression of your target, um, you may have some delivery of the chemotherapeutic to a normal tissue that may not tolerate it as well. And so that's the so that's why the Claudins are very um, exciting right now, and that's why you know we developed our, an antibody drug conjugate towards the Claudin eighteen point two. Continuing along that line, um, as cool as that, as cool as that part of the story is, um, the uh, the the chemo agent um, is something called EO thirty twenty one, and this was really cool because I, I spent a couple careers ago time in the natural product space, and this is really interesting because this thing uh, monomethyl orostatin E comes from this nasty looking yep. uh, sea slug, <laughs> which yes. Is, Yes. Cool part of the story. I mean, the, I, personally, I love this. Story. Um, is that it is not? It's extremely poisonous by itself. But when you link this thing up as an antibody drug conjugate, uh, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic magic happens. And, and this is really the cool part of the story because here's a natural product that I guess in the traditional sense might have just been thrown away. We can't use it. It's it's. Right. All these properties. Now we could use it and do really cool things with it. Talk about EO thirty twenty one, if you would. Yeah, sure. So EO thirty twenty one is there. It's so it's antibody drug conjugate. So it's Claudin a Claudin eight point two targeted and selected selective antibody. Um, it is has a what is known as a valine citrulline linker. So it's called right. a cleavable linker, um, and that linker gets cleaved by an enzyme called cathepsin B. And cathepsin B is typically only in endos of all lysosomes, we'll say in intracellular component of the cell or a vesicle of the cell. And so what that means is that MMEE molecule only gets released intracellularly wherever your target's expressed, right? So um, what that whole nature is, right? The selectivity of the tumor antigen, the linker um, being like a thepsin B cleavable means it only gets to the tumor cell in theory, right? That's the whole concept behind it. And we We've shown data to, to kind of back that up. Now, the other magic apart of ADCs, and this is going to, I'm now going to refer back to history, right? So what we learned about 20 years ago, and I'll refer to a molecule called Milotarg, um, sure. uh, right, from a long time ago, right? Yeah. And what we learned, a hard lesson there was, is that when you have an antibody linker and payload, it turns out the linker is critical, 
part of like stability and how you conjugate the linker to the antibody. So there's two things you have to think about, the linker stability as well as the conjugation stability. And so what we've learned over the last like 20 to say 10 years is that the conjugation part to the antibody is critical for stability of the ADC because you want it to be intact while it's, while it's circulating in your body until it gets to the tumor. And then you want it to essentially be cleaved by an enzyme and then released only in the cancer cell. So this is the kind of the cool part behind the science of EO3021 is that we conjugate it to um, uh, a native glutamine residue on the antibody. And what that means is you have this stable um, amide bond that is locking on the linker payload to the antibody. And so what it means is it's less susceptible to deconjugation. And so that means it's more intact. And it means that the whole, if you will, whatever you're infusing into the, um, the patient is actually getting to the tumor and it's not basically falling apart. And so some of the earlier ADCs, they did kind of do that. And unfortunately, that resulted in some various, um, some in the case of Mylotar, clearly um, it was withdrawn until 2017. Um, and then and in the case of other antibodies that use different methods of conjugation, where they are subject to this basically payload falling off called deconjugation, um, those definitely have limitations on how high you can dose in patients. And so by definition, limiting efficacy. So EO3021, uh, you're studying it um, as both monotherapy and in combination. I know, I, I guess there's a phase one study going on right now, I think in, in Japan, which I, I, I have to go back to the notes here, but uh, talk a little bit about what's happened to date. I, I think the the combination therapy, you're still maybe getting an IND on that, but um, walk us through what's happening in, in particular with regard to uh, for this particular uh, development program. Yeah, and, yeah, but yeah for sure. Yeah, for sure. And 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 as David as David and I mentioned, I mean, all these advancements in ADC technologies have come such a long way that we can do things now that just weren't possible before. Now, granted, that's because we've learned a lot as an industry and as as a field. And one of those ways is exactly what David said, which is hopefully maximize efficacy and minimize. Uh, uh, off, off tumor toxicity that none of us want. That is often the case with chemo, right? And part of our approach with 3021 was because of the technology used for, for our, our ADC was meant to minimize the toxicities that are troublesome for patients that usually end up in less than optimal cancer treatments. And our partner, the, uh, the Chinese company that we in licensed 3021 from CSPC, they presented data last year at ASCO where they showed a 47% overall response rate in gastric cancer. Um, now, our development at 3021 is very specific to gastric cancer because, as David said, um, the impact of chlorine 18.2 once uh, tumors go cancerous is really impactful for us to use that in order to deliver the cytotoxic in a targeted way. That data that our, that our, that our partner presented showed that it was definitely a drug that was making a difference for patients above and beyond what they have available to them based on standard of care therapies today. But it also showed that that new technology, that that specific conjugation technology that David mentioned was leading to an eight with a tolerability profile that was different than what we would have expected based on older technologies and one that was less onerous on the patient. And it was incredibly valuable for us as a company to know that we had an active agent with a differentiated safety and tolerability profile before we even dosed the first patient in our own trial. We started dosing patients in our phase one, our first to dose escalation trial in August last year at US sites. And as you mentioned, we moved into sites in Japan in February of this year. Now gastric cancer is a little bit unique because the incidence and prevalence of gastric cancer is actually higher in Eastern countries and Eastern populations versus here in the West. So it was incredibly meaningful for us to go into a country like Japan and start enrolling patients as part of our trial sooner than what a company like us otherwise would in its, its, in its life cycle. And this has allowed us to be able to look at a broader worldwide population sooner rather than later as we think about advancing the drug forward in, in our phase one studies. All this is as a single agent. We said that we're going to show the first data from our phase one trial uh, by mid third quarter. So in, in the coming months, we're gonna share for the first time 
data from what we think 3021 can do in our own trial above and beyond what our partner in China showed last year. And as you mentioned, in oncology, single agent is great, but combination therapy is an, is an opportunity to improve patient outcomes even more. So we also think it's important to uh, bring 3021 in parallel into combination studies, combinations with different types of agents that back to what David said in the very beginning and just thinking about how oncology treatment has evolved, the opportunity to use multiple drugs to target the heterogeneity that occurs in any oncology, in any solid tumor and oncology in general. Um, while we're on this topic, um, David, if you could say, I, I know last month, I think it was, you were uh, at ACR and you were presenting on your second major candidate, which is focused on uh, HER3. Um, and this is a, a very interesting target. We're not just talking about uh, breast cancer, but potential small cell lung cancer and some other solid tumors. Uh, maybe the audience is a little less familiar with HER3. I hear a lot about HER2. Um, can you say a few words about this agent? I know this is in, in preclinical development, but it's uh, it's equally cool, and I uh, love you to tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so this, as you said, this is our, our second pipeline program, and earlier uh, research, we'll say, um, we are essentially targeting HER3. Now, HER3 HER is uh, part of the same family as EGFR, HER2, and HER4, or RBB3 is the old name for it. Um, and essentially, right, they, HER3 partners with other uh, members of the family. So usually because it has a heterodimer, usually with HER2 is its most popular one, but with her with EGFR also has been found. Um, typically, people have been pursuing HER3, um, we'll say 15 years ago-ish, uh, plus, you know, we're trying to block signaling of the HER3 or dimerization of our EGFR and HER3, and, and such approaches had limited success, to, to, to be polite. Um, and so where the kind of the field rejuvenated a little bit was, well, these seem like very good targets for antibody drug conjugates, right? They're overexpressed in various cancers. And you mentioned a couple of them where it's very clear HER3 is overexpressed, like EGFR, uh, uh, mutant and wild type lung cancer, as well as um, breast cancer. And that's across the, her the breast cancer subtypes as well. It's not restricted. And so we've been thinking about, you know, well, this is a target that's not say new, it's been around, but however, it's a particular target where you could apply newer technology that, that we're mentioning on the on the on the ADCs that actually could deliver enough of a chemotherapy payload into the tumor. If we used old school technology from like 20, 25 years ago, wouldn't work as well. And so this is why you know we see an opportunity right now to chase after something that's a well-validated target. We know there are other people um, have been trying HER3. Uh, with an ADC, and there, there is one that's uh, further along clinical development um, using a TOPO-1 um, inhibitor uh, payload. Um, we see an opportunity not only just for the technology uh, advancements to get, like, a, let's just say something that's uh, better uh, conjugated and more stable, but also an opportunity to, to test a, a payload that has not uh, let's just say not being uh, tested at this time in this population. And so we're planning on nominating a development candidate um, this year, and certainly we'll display more, uh, we'll say more about it later on this year. Uh, but suffice to say, you know, we see this as a great opportunity to, to go after um, hair free expressing cancers with a differentiated molecule and differentiated payload. Excellent. A couple of weeks ago, you were uh, you led a fireside chat at the, uh, the Citizens JMP Life Science Conference. Uh, what did you talk about? I'm, I'm sure it's uh, you know <laughs> the, the the institutional investor uh, audience out there is extremely excited <laughs> about everything you got going on. But uh, tell us about your time at JMP and, and what else is coming up for the year in terms of uh, the company, you know, broadly from the perspective of uh, uh, of uh, its development and, and further financing. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly the Citizens JMP conference was a great opportunity to engage face to face with investors, institutional investors, and others in the industry. And uh, it's always a great time, especially in New York, to be able to tell the story even more to a wider audience. You know, as we, David and I, have been saying, you know, we're building, we're leveraging the latest in ADC technologies and our expertise in it to to build a differentiated pipeline. And we're starting with EO three zero two one, and as David just mentioned, our second program, our HER three ADC. 
you know, every year I feel like I say it's going to be a transformative, a transformative year for elevation oncology. And so far every year, that's been exactly the case. And 2024 is no different. I mean, looking forward from where we go from here, you know, the releasing the first clinical data from our phase one trial of EO3021 by, as I said, by mid third quarter is going to be an important event for us as we continue to show the world what we're doing with the program in order to drive it forward and how it can make a difference for patients living with cancer. Um, another important event for us this year is, is driving that HER3 ADC forward. And as David mentioned, we plan to name a development candidate. And there's a lot that the team has done to, to get us to that point in order to get to the point where we say, okay, this is the ADC, this is the ADC construct and the molecule that we think is gonna be the one in order to be differentiated going forward. Um, and over the longer term, you know, we certainly look forward to continuing to use this latest in technology to build a pipeline that's going to continue to have better outcomes overall. And we look forward to telling the world about it later this year and in general as we keep building the company. Awesome. And Dave, any final messages on, on the science front? I mean, you, you walked us through the uh, the biochemistry and the molecular biology that's going on. You, you took us into clinical strategy. Uh, I, I read this interesting article that you uh, were involved in a bioprocess on, on the fact that, you know, we're also, it's important to manufacture these things on large scale. And we're finally at the stage where we can do that. Uh, any other final notes while we have you on uh, on general on the, on the ADC uh, domain? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just say that um, the things to watch out for is that now that we understand uh, how to build with Lego blocks, if you will, with the ADCs, they were now finding different colors of Legos in the form of payloads, right? So the one thing is like we talk about chemotherapy and the base payloads and they're great. We love them. We're doing them here. A lot of other people, of course, are doing them as well. But there's also opportunities at a field at large for doing things that are different. They're not, it can be small molecule, small molecule inhibitors of signaling. It could be like uh, general things like protein degraders or molecular glues. These are all things now we can really conceivably consider conjugating to antibodies because we understand now how to build them better. And so I think that what you're going to see is in the next five years, you know, as a, as a field. And that is really this, uh, again, the, the renaissance of not just old school ADCs, but actually just now we're, now we're making new molecules that should have like um, significant impact on patient outcomes. So that's one thing I just, I'll, I'll leave you with that I think is absolutely an exciting area. And I think that, you know, we're, we're going to see some really cool stuff in the next five years out of the clinic to that effect. It's extremely exciting, and it's you know, and as Joe was saying before, you know, it, the, you know, in this sort of continuum of what's existed, the fact that you're sort of smack in the middle of the sweet spot of of where everything's heading, um, I, I'm excited for you, and um, I just uh, I look forward to to continue to follow uh, you guys and the company, and really wish you the best with this as you as you execute on on the clinical programs both in the United States and abroad, uh, but really, really great stuff. Um, again, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to uh, this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or who will be watching on our YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to uh, Joseph Farah and Dr. David Dornan, um, CEO and Chief Scientific Officer of Elevation Oncology. Um, guys, I really want to thank you both for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about everything you have going on. Uh, obviously, thank you for what you're doing for the, the future of oncology, for precision oncology. And as we like to say here on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many patients out there via what you're doing in, in your company. Really a great story. Yeah, I, we really appreciate it. We love your podcast and really, really honored to be able to be a part of it and really appreciate what you're doing and to continue and get the message out there for everything that science is doing as well. So thank you to you as well. Great having yeah, both of you. Much.